All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Clean Power Hour. Uh, I'm your host, Eric Meyer. Uh, we have a great show for you today, very excited about it. Uh, we have some folks joining us from uh, Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation, USNC, um, as well as their friends from OPG, Ontario Power Generation, who have embarked on a joint venture called Global First Power. Um, so uh, I'm going to let uh, our friends introduce themselves and uh, we'll get into talking about their exciting project to build a micro reactor in, uh, at, in Chalk River up at Canadian Nuclear Labs. Um, so uh, yeah, let's uh, go ahead and start with our, uh, our kind of main, main guest, I guess, as it were. Um, Mark Mitchell, uh, president of USNC uh, North America here. Uh, Mark, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi guys. Um, my name is Mark Mitchell. Um, I am uh, president of USNC Power and I lead Ultrasafe Nuclear's efforts to uh, finalize the development and commercial deployment of a micro modular reactor. Great, awesome. And uh, Wendy? Hi guys, my name is Wendy Simon Pearson. I'm the general counsel of Ultrasafe Nuclear but I'm not here as a lawyer today. Um, we're still a relatively small operation, and so I take on some of the more public-facing PR-style interfacing roles in addition to my legal duties. Um, so everyone relax, it's okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so I've been with the company for a little while now, and I do a lot of the work with Mark um, on the legal side and negotiation side of putting together the project at Chalk River. Awesome, great, and uh, Eric? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Eric. Uh, my name is Eric McGowey, and I'm the director of remote generation development life. for Ontario Power Generation. But I wear a second hat on the project that we have with USNC. Um, there for Global First Power, I am the director of engagement and communication, and have been leading our engagement um, with communities in the uh, Ottawa Valley region near uh, Chalk River Laboratories where we have our commercial demonstration project uh, with Global First Power. Excellent. Well, I'm uh, glad to have uh, such experts uh, here today to answer our, our, our questions and those from our audience. Um, speaking of which, uh, we do uh, already have a few coming in um, from, from the interwebs here, um, but if you would like to submit a question, um, we have uh, Sean from Al Alberta Nuclear Nucleus who is here. Uh, helping us monitor our various uh, social channels for the questions. Um, and you can see in uh, the right part of the screen, uh, some of them are being filtered in um, uh, through this uh, restream program we're using. So hopefully this works. We're kind of experimenting with it a little bit. We'll see how it goes, <laughs> if it's helpful or not. Um, great. Well, uh, let's let's get into it here. Uh, we, um, you know, we hear a lot about uh, the promise of uh, advanced reactors, but um, I'm guessing um, you all have uh, different different things that you are excited about, different motivations for working on this project. Um, let's uh, let's start with Mark first. How you know how did you even get into nuclear, and how do you uh, what what excites you about this project that you're working on um, with uh, OPG? Well. Um, uh I think um, nuclear for me has been a bit of a lifelong journey. So I got uh, roped into nuclear probably 20 years ago in South Africa. I was on the Pebble Bid project. Um, and it immediately became clear that there were, you know, we, we always had a view that there were one or two really cool places to work. Uh, one of them was nuclear power and the other one was probably space. Um, and at the time, South Africa was doing nuclear power. So that was a, a really good place to work. Um, I think what's what I'm an engineer by training. And that's where I come from. So I initially uh, joined uh, mostly for the technical challenges. Um, you know, the, it's it's uh, it's complicated uh, technical work with a really good payoff and exciting place to work. Um, but over time, I became much more interested in the in the bigger benefits and the, you know the real reasons for nuclear. And I believe you know quite firmly. Uh, that nuclear is absolutely essential in terms of moving from where we are today to a much uh, 
more environmentally compatible uh, industry and lifestyle. And, you know, that's sort of what really motivates me today, uh, much more than initially was just, you know, uh, making a much better mousetrap. Right. Yeah. I think we've all, you know, maybe probably everybody on this call and certainly some of our viewers have had some frustration with uh, the, the potential of, of the industry not being fully realized and the potential of just, I guess, fission in general um, because of mm. you know, technological decisions that were made um, 40, 50 years ago because of the political environment that resulted in some of those <laughs> um, decisions. Um, so it's, it's exciting that we're now kind of entering a second era here. Um, so, um, yeah, your, your team, um, you guys are working together to build a commercial demonstration micro reactor in Chalk, in Chalk River here um, called the Micro Modular Reactor. Uh, how, how did this project first come about and what, what are you guys hoping to accomplish with it? And uh, yeah. And, um, yeah. Well, let, let, let me let me say something and then uh, and then I, I think I'm going to ask Eric if he can if he can add. Um, USNC initially started developing advanced nuclear fuel. Uh, we were a small team of folk who, who came out of the US national labs. Um, and in about 2014, uh, we met a like-minded team, um, who were looking to, uh, establish micro, uh, nuclear reactors as a way of generating power for remote, uh, remote, uh, settlements and remote mines in Northern Canada. And that was basically the start of the program that that's led to this point. So, um, you know, we've been we've been working continuously uh, for this. We think it's a really worthy area. We think it's a place where uh, nuclear has an absolutely unparalleled value that it brings. Um, and so that was sort of the idea of the product. Uh, but but, you know, if you haven't actually got an example working, you don't have a product, you just have an idea. Um, and I think that's where uh, over time, uh getting into a position where we are now uh where we are actually establishing have established a project to deploy a demonstration unit is absolutely critical um eric yeah thanks mark so um uh, i guess i'll i'll go back a question uh to add some context to um to answering this one and, and that's you know i i grew up in northern ontario um in, in a city called thunder bay um where you know, we, we got most of our power from hydro. We also had a coal plant. And then I, I ended up in, um, working as a political staffer for a party that won an election in 2003, largely on a promise to phase out coal in Ontario. And in, in fact, was able to successfully do that because of nuclear. Uh, you know, on both 60% of Ontario's power uh, on the grid comes from nuclear power plants. And so I, I that coal closure in Ontario ended up being the, the single largest um, action to fight climate change that we've seen in North America to date. And I think that really um, captured a lot of attention from decision makers and, and the idea of having this off grid alternative for when you have remote communities, remote mines, where transmission is just unaffordable. Um, the idea of using very small modular reactors um, as an alternative to diesel um, started, I think, getting a lot of attention. And frankly, OPG was in touch with a lot of different vendors that, um, that you know, were making a whole bunch of claims. Um, some of them seemed more credible than others. And when we had the opportunity to partner with USNC um, at Chalk River on this commercial demonstration, I think this really lets us cut through a lot of the marketing, cut through a lot of the claims and get to the point where um, I like to tell people, this isn't a science project we're doing at Chalk River, it's a business project. This is about determining whether best case scenario, we can make uh, SMR power production competitive with diesel reactors off grid. That, that would be a wonderful conclusion to reach with the commercial model. Um, once we have the, this project up and running. The worst case, I, I think, we can at least prove that we're competitive against transmission. And, and I think, um, you know, there, there's obviously a delta in there that'll be really interesting. Um, and, and we're getting a lot of interest in particular from remote mines um, who right now um, have to worry about the logistics of diesel. 
And over a 20 year life of mine, um, not being able to buy diesel futures, not knowing how much you're going to be paying for energy, you know, in year 10, year 15 is a bit daunting. So if we can bring them cost certainty um, with a, a business model built around SMRs, that's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, on, Ontario was an eye opener for me as well. Uh, mm -hmm. There are so many countries that are these days saying, oh, you know, maybe we'll be able to burn our last load of coal in 2038, maybe 2050. If we do everything right, we'll finally get there. But that for Ontario, that was six years ago. <laughs> um, and it kind of did almost, I don't know, it, it, it happened a little too easily in a way. Um, but uh, let's, uh, so we have a few questions in coming online. I think it'd be helpful to kind of ground, ground ourselves in what this reactor looks like and what it does so people can kind of get a visual. Um, so uh, can, I don't know who, who wants to take this. Maybe this is a Mark question. Maybe it's an Eric question, but how big is this reactor physically? Like what, what does it look like? Um, is this, we're putting it on a truck? Is it, you know, something you could put in the basement of your house? What, what are we looking at? Yeah. Um, uh that I think um, you know the remote applications are are very special. You'll typically have to access them over a winter road uh, or some other complicated thing. Maybe even flying in parts of equipment. Um, so these things have to be very. Uh, you know, we we've uh, optimized our design that everything comes in the back of a truck and and gets assembled on site. Um, the physical size, uh, I often. Um, that the sort of the entire reactor area is a footprint of a, of a squash court, a racquetball court, I guess they're a problem. Um, I, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, a fully deployed plant full of its peripherals and stuff is quite small, probably, probably the size of a, a, a hockey rink. Um, and, uh, you know, and that, and that sort of gives you a flavor for what you do. Um, I would say that, you know, often the applications we look at, space is not the absolute constraint. So we, you know, we could probably comp that a lot. Uh, but these are really small reactors. You know, the, 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 by comparison to what you're used to, um, the power output is, is a factor of a thousand nearly smaller. So this is about a five megawatt electric unit per unit. Uh, we would deploy them uh, in groups of one through 10. Am I dropping? Okay. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, I say deploy in, uh, we deploy in uh, sort of, uh, you know, units one through 10. Um, and that internet, allows maybe? us to match uh, match the application, but those are still very small. So anyway, those are those are the ideas, yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, well, that's that's pretty Wendy, helpful. And what, what kind of uh, power output are we talking for a, a small size like that? A single unit will put out about five megawatts electrical. Uh, we could put out, you know, when you look at, uh, at um, five megawatts electrical, really the idea is to deploy many units, not just to deploy one. So if you need more power, you would just put, put more of these units next to each other. Um, the power is constrained because we designed these units to be fueled once in their life of 20 years. So we put down the unit and run it for 20 years. So that simplifies a lot, uh, meaning you could probably go to higher power if you shorten the lifetime if you needed to. I think before we do the next question, it's helpful within the context of talking about the size of the re reactor to go into the reason why the reactor is so much smaller than a traditional reactor, which is the safety features of the fuel mixed with the reactor itself. So when we're talking about the project, we're talking about building the reactor, how big is the footprint, et cetera, et cetera. But why is the footprint so much smaller? It's not because we're compromising anything relating to safety or anything like that. Um, the reason why we can do something like this is because of a proprietary fuel source that was developed by the founders of USNC in the US National Lab System in the past couple of decades. Um, and what that fuel system has done is taken the safety precautions of traditional nuclear power plants, which, you know, you have a bunch of uranium, you pack it into a fuel rod, and then you create these layers of safety systems surrounding them in order to ensure that in the worst case scenario, there are different protection systems that, 
that come in to protect um, the outside world from the substance itself. What we've done instead is we take the uranium, it's low enriched uranium, we take it in about one millimeter wide little balls called trisoparticles, which have five different layers of protective coating. And then we distribute that within an additional substance afterwards called silicon carbide. And this is what creates our FCM fuel. And the silicon carbide itself is pretty special. It's one of the hardest substances known to man. And it effectively creates an impenetrable block between the radiation inside and the outside of the world. Um, and when you combine that FCM fuel with the MMR reactor in the way we've designed it, the heat of the reactor itself actually never gets hot enough to melt down the fuel. And so because of that, there's certain different ways that we can put a project like this together in terms of saving money, just in terms of the business model, and also in terms of um, passive rather than active safety systems, which is pretty exciting. Hmm. Wow. So you, you just said that, uh, let me get this straight. The, <laughs> the reactor doesn't need to be refueled, um, more than once every 20 years. So does that mean it can run, uh, constantly, uh, over that period of time? Yes. Wow. That is incredible. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're talking like a hundred percent capacity factor then what's, uh, <laughs> what is that? That's crazy. Um, all right. Well, fantastic. Uh, I have a few more questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, we got another one from the, the, the internet here. Uh, any statistics on Canadian knowledge of nuclear being low carbon, any polls to cite, do people know this is a low carbon audio, uh, low carbon, uh, energy source? Yeah, um, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, there, there have been some um, some public opinion research that have been done by organizations like the Canadian Nuclear Association, and um, I, I think the last one showed that 86% of Canadians accept uh, uh, nuclear as a low low emissions um, uh, uh, fuel fuel source that uh, or energy source rather that um, should be used in the, in the fight against climate change, which is really what, what this is all about. Um, no, I, I, that's not to say that people don't have other um, concerns about, uh, about nuclear, particularly related to, to safety, where I think we've got an excellent track record and an excellent story to tell as an industry. And then also about waste, um, where uh, we also have a, a pretty good story, but it's not quite as good as the safety story, right? And the, safety story is fantastic. We haven't had, you know, a single fatality involving, um, you know, staff or, uh, of course, the public in, in the history of nuclear. Op operations in Canada that um, and uh, it would be lovely if, if we, our, our waste story was that black and white. Um, but, you know, we, we recognize that there, there is waste associated with all forms of generation, even frankly, renewables. Um, and so uh, a lot of the, uh, I think the, the debate that we're in is about having people understand the way that different technologies are suited for different purposes and about how, you know, intermittent fuels uh, or, or sources of energy like solar is fantastic um, when everybody turns on their air conditioner in the summer in Southern Ontario to help, you know, put with those peaks. Um, but in terms of the baseline generation, you need something that's from mm -hmm. um, you know, when the wind is in Canada, you've got, you know, Quebec, Manitoba, Newfoundland and Labrador, British Columbia, they have such rich, that really, they're not, but anywhere else that doesn't have the, those rich hydro resources um, is, I think, starting to look seriously at nuclear as an alternative to fossil fuel generation. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's great to hear. Um, yeah, sorry, we're having a, a couple little uh, flickers in the bandwidth, so I just wanted to, for our audience, just apologize for that and uh, thank you for your your patience um, as we uh, get a little more stable internet connection. <laughs> um, so one one thing you you mentioned that um, you know there are there are a few options 
people have to choose from. Uh, why would they go with this uh, type of reactor, this type of energy solution versus something like some solar panels and, and battery storage or some uh, wind, wind turbines or something of lo like that? What's, what's, the, what's the case, the value case that you guys are making? So I'll, I'll, I'll hand this over to Mark because I've, I've been talking too much on, uh, on, on his show. But, but before I do, I, what I'd say is um, I, I think it's fair to say we welcome the competition. And we acknowledge that there's going to be um, people with other technologies, you know, with small modular reactors or with a combination of renewals, battery storage, micro hydro, all of that. Everybody, this is a, climate change is an all hands on deck kind of scenario. And we need everybody bringing forward their best projects and their best models um, in that fight. And there's going to be different advantages to different technologies uh, in different use cases. And so we're quite confident that we've identified some um, that, that are going to be very persuasive. And the whole point of this commercial demonstration project is we don't want you to take our word for it. We want to be able to show you, uh, you know, bring people in, bring them to the site, let them uh, see the reactor. Mm -hmm. That's really what this is going to be about. We're, we're, we we want to prove it. Mm. Mark? Just to elaborate on that a little bit, um, we don't see this as competition to renewables. We see yeah. it as a complement. Nuclear fulfills yeah. a complementary separate function to renewable energy. And if climate change is our goal, which for many of us it is, um, then we need to have both the baseload power to address energy needs, period and energy needs in remote areas or when the sun doesn't shine or when all these other factors come into play, but that can pair with renewables quite easily. Yeah. You can have wind, you can have yeah. solar that deals with peaks. Um, and as battery, uh, as battery power storage gets better, that will be more and more useful, but you're always going to need that baseload power because nobody wants to turn off the air conditioner when it's not a sunny day. Yeah, um, and that's that actually pairs uh, really well with the question we just had coming in, talking about uh, lo load falling capabilities of this kind of technology. Yeah. We've we've seen in the in the U.S. Um, when there's a, there's a lot of wind, for example, it can be unprofitable for a nuclear plant to continue running because they might have to deal with negative pricing and that kind of thing. And I realize this is a lot smaller of a reactor, but how how does it pair with those more intermittent sources of energy? Yeah, I think um, I, I think it's it's actually perfectly suitable to work with them, and I think that's an unusual feature uh, that actually comes from our first application. Uh, when you're uh, serving a remote microgrid and you're the only generator, you have to be able to adjust how much you're generating to match the load as it changes, and um, and you have really no other options, and so. You know the system that we've designed and we'll demonstrate at chalk river really is about that it's about being able to to follow load extremely dynamically um, and that's also why um you know we're, we're not like traditional nuclear it's not about just taking the flexibility um about being able to adjust the plant to to meet uh what the community we're serving needs uh not just generally in terms of do they need heat do they need electricity but also you know second for second as as the power goes up and down as uh generators may be embedded solar panels on roofs are, are generating or, or falling off um so yeah i think it's extremely flexible you know when i when i when i look for an analogy i would say that um the mmr energy system that we put down uh it performs dynamically a lot like a, a gas peaker uh, more than a sort of conventional big heavy iron uh, coal plant there, there are some uh, inquisitive yeah. minds uh, as to how exactly the load falling works. If you could throw in a couple more details. Also clarify oh, what the Tika is. Well, okay. <laughs> clarify what? You said it, it acts more like a gas Tika and- Oh, oh, oh no, oh. A, 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 a gas, sorry, a, a gas peaker. Uh, uh, yeah, a, a gas turbine that's used to, 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 to help trim, you know, reach the most dynamic loads. Um, yeah, so, so, so we have uh, the hybrid energy system has many options, but really at the core of the nuclear power system is isolated from um, the grid uh, or the microgrid in this case, 
uh, via molten salt in molten salt energy storage system. And that from that molten salt reservoir, uh, we can dispatch. Uh, normally, today it would be a steam turbine, but probably in the near future we'll move to things like supercritical CO2 turbines, uh, which are even more dynamic. Uh, but you can dispatch a steam turbine very quickly. And these are not, uh, you know, these typical very large power station steam turbines. These are uh, industrial package turbines, which are really used in a lot of industrial facilities today. Um, and they're pretty dynamic, you know, that you can you can actually drive them pretty quickly because we don't need to move the reactor quickly to move the load quickly, effectively, because we have the buffer, which is the molten salt. So that's... Uh, that's sort of the, the more technical thing. And then, of course, we can also um, add additional generating sources or add uh, battery storage or, or other things, uh, you know, other devices, if I put it that way, into the microgrid to even improve the situation. Great. Thank you for that. Um, all right. We have a few more questions here uh, coming in. Um, let's see. Uh, Somebody is wondering... Uh, if if this could function as a prototype for some kind of space reactor, um, they're mentioning that there's really high materials temperature capabilities. Do you have do you have moon base plans? <laughs> we actually kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> so we we um, that's not part of our our main business operations, but we have an entire subsidiary referred to as USNC Tech, Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation Technologies which is based out of Seattle, Washington, that exclusively exclusively works on nuclear thermal propulsion for space propulsion. Um, so they work with NASA on subcontracts and contracts to, to push that concept. It's a, I think it's a billion dollar pro program at this point um, to push that concept. And, and the cool application for those types of um, space-based applications is that, especially when you're talking about a Mars mission, for example, if you have a, a nuclear thermal propulsion system, essentially where you have a tiny little nuclear reactor inside of the rocket instead of these large containers of traditional um, uh, fuel that you would use, um, you can limit the amount of time it would take to go round trip to Mars from about two years to about six months. Um, and based on the radiation damage that a human being would sustain by, just by being in, in space for that long, that makes it so that somebody could go to Mars and come back and survive the process. Um, so that's huge and that's really exciting. Um, uh, it, it's, <laughs> it sucks that you bring it up because as soon as you start talking about the space stuff we do, <laughs> nobody wants to talk about our terrestrial reactors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you gotta be able to do it on, on Earth before you can do it in space, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the whole idea. Yes. Makes sense. Wow, oh, that's... Uh, it's super fascinating. Um, of course, it's 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 in the future. Um, uh, some people are wondering, you know, how far out? How when are you guys hoping? If if everything goes smoothly, when are you hoping to have, show the first demonstration and you know be, be able to show it to the public, uh, have people tour and and whatnot? Well, I mean, we're we're certainly going to invite everyone to the party. Um, <laughs> I should say that. Um, you know, we're in the licensing and permitting process, um, and that's not a process with an absolute guaranteed schedule at the moment. Uh, we do, uh, we're, we're supporting, however, the uh, Canadian Nuclear Laboratory's objective of having a reactor running on site by 2026. Um, you know, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to say that we're working uh, absolutely flat out to beat that date with a very good margin, uh, but we're not promising it just yet. Um, but, you know, please look out for the, uh, the Generation Atomic invite to the opening party. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, I, I, you know, I understand the, the purpose of this demonstration is, is really to um, build public confidence that uh, these, these projects are uh, good for the community, that they can be built on time and on budget. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to that end, um, I know that you're, you're not only talking about the electricity that, that can be generated here, but you're talking about some of the other applications. Uh, can you paint a picture for me uh, how this reactor would integrate into a community, what kind of businesses it could help uh, spring up around it and, and why that is? I understand it might have something to do with the temperature of the reactor versus conventional reactors. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start that off. I, I think that um, with heat, you can do a lot of things. And often uh, com converting your heat to electricity and then having to convert it back to heat again is not the most efficient way of going about uh, what you want to do. Um, and then I'll, and then I'll take a detour and say that you know these these uh, mines and communities are extremely energy constrained. So uh, especially if you're in the Arctic, um, there is not a lot of, uh, of of energy you know from from sun. Uh, the wind is not easily usable, um, and you know you don't have a lot of every any fuel that you need to burn. You have to bring there. And that's that's really a very difficult position to be in, um, and that means every you know energy is used very sparingly. Now, um, it's it's interesting because when you have the option of of a small reactor like this, which can bring an abundance not only of electricity, uh, but also uh, heat, even if it's a very low quality heat in an engineering sense, but it's enough to warm houses. That takes a lot of pressure off, off the resources that you have to bring there. So, so you know, so so really, it's about um, a, a, probably a radical improvement in quality of life uh, as a start, uh, and then you get a lot of um, a lot of added benefits. So, so things like um, uh, one of our uh, our team was uh, spent some time in Nunavut in the town of Iqaluit, and was particularly impressed by the price of a tomato. Uh, in the grocery store, and I forget the exact number, but it was something horrific, like four dollars or something. Um, and that's because that tomato basically has more frequent flyer miles than I do, um, you know. And, and and so everything is basically brought in, um, and and you know, so so even a a very um, not technically exciting uh, project like uh, heating a greenhouse or uh, heating a, a fish farm so that there's there's fresh fish year round. Um, are potentially absolutely radical game changers. Um, so you know, not even not even have before we start looking at the the more advanced industrial applications like unlocking uh, at at source of extraction uh, minerals processing for a mine, for instance, uh, just for the people living there, I think it's going to make a huge difference. Absolutely. Um... Yeah, I could see, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of talk about communities being off the grid and, and self-sustainable, uh, but that's, it's hard to do that with a, a power source that's, that's either uh, dependent on uh, outside supply lines, constantly flying in fuel, um, or, yeah. uh, or power sources that, you know, are, are more weather dependent. Um, but this really would open up some new opportunities, I think. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, to get into the uh, aspect, so th these are smaller, so we're 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 hoping that they can be uh, produced in factories eventually. Correct? Um, what's yes. what is the pathway from from here, where we're just trying to demonstrate that this this works, um, to actually getting it in a factory? And how many could you really feasibly make in a factory over a, a given period of time? Yeah, I mean that. Uh, so, 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 so to sort of share our thoughts, because we, we don't think there is an upper limit. So, uh, you know, USNC in the US is, is headquartered in Seattle. Um, and we have an example, which is maybe not always a, a good example to cite today, but, but uh, of Boeing, you know, Boeing is a neighbor. And, um, and, you know, this, this technology is, you know, technically and economically about equivalent to a 737. Um, which is where this analogy sometimes gets a little fraught, but, but um, you know, so so just so you understand, um, two years ago now, Boeing uh, made over 500 737s in a year. So, you know, in terms of when you move to mass production, um, the, the way it works changes, and how people think about making things changes, and uh, you know, the most the most common energy source or power source made in the world today are uh, automobile engines. And you know, the number of gigawatts in automobile engines deployed every year is a staggering number. It's, it's you know, many multiples of, of the entire electricity generating fleet. Um, and, uh, and that's because of scaling through mass production. Uh, now, when we talk of demonstrating a chalk river, um, we, we're not, it's not for us so much about 
demonstrating uh, the physics of the reactor or that we can boil water and make steam and drive a turbine. And that this is absolutely something we're certain of. Um, it's much more about demonstrating these kind of aspects of the project, demonstrating that we can fabricate off site and bring and assemble on site. We can do it really quickly. Um, you know, that, 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 that we, we understand the, the logistics, the, the dynamics. We, you know, these are the key aspects, I think, in our minds of the demonstration, because we want to not just demonstrate that we can deploy a plant and that we can make power at, at, a, at a known price and understand the economics, but we want to demonstrate that we would be able to deploy a plant like this anywhere. And mm. I think that's a, that's a much more ambitious ask. Mm. It's right. also useful to put this within the context of um, why have you only ever heard of nuclear power plants in the United States, for example, going over cost and over budget and never, never being built on time. And one of the reasons behind that is specifically the construction, the onsite construction costs. And the benefits of doing something in a modularized, modu modularized, sorry, um, factory-based manner instead of the traditional on-site building process is that you cut out the uncertainty for both cost and time. And so the the goal of, of not, it's not a goal. I mean, that's the business model. It's not that we are going to try to do it, and if we don't, you know, if if it doesn't work out, then we're going to do something else. No, this is the business model. The business model is to set it up doing it the way Boeing did it and to cut out the on-site construction uncertainty that comes with the, the problems that we've seen in the past with nuclear. So that uh, that actually maybe begs the question, because those are those are massive construction projects with uh, thousands of, of workers. Um, so, you know, often energy projects are, are sold in the terms of jobs that they're going to provide. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what kind of jobs we can we can expect, at least for the the CNL uh, project, the, the Global First Power project, um, and uh, in both in terms of, of building the reactor and then in terms of maintaining, operating, uh, etc. Eric, I don't know if you if you want to speak to that or uh, or I, I can start. Sure. Um, it, it, it's a great question, Eric, and, and it's one that you would expect we we get a lot from um, from the communities in in, in and around uh, Chuck River, and uh, our honest answer um, has been uh, focused on on really adjusting people's expectations. You know, our the the can do. Uh, style reactors that were have been deployed across Canada and that OPG operates. You know, the, the our old CEO used to make the joke that um, you know they, they run on natural uranium. So essentially, we're in the business of burning dirt. Um, but but the the truth is uh, that can do's run on people. You need thousands and thousands of people because they're so complex. And so a, a lot of what we've been doing is is readjusting people's expectations and having them understand that there might be tens of people that might be employed on a project like the one at Chalk River, um, but it's not going to be hundreds and it's certainly not going to be thousands. And, and so um, it, that, that, that cuts both ways, right? The um, obviously, local communities are always receptive to an economic message about um, jobs. Um, you know, our, our sector tends to pay well, good unionized jobs. Um, uh, so it's understandable people would be excited about that. On the other hand, part of what makes the commercial model so appealing about small modular reactors is that you can run them with fewer people. And so, you know, that you need to kind of square that circle. And so a lot of what I've been doing as I've been out engaging with communities it is explaining that this is not the same, uh, you know, nuclear reactor that your uncle might've won um, where there were thousands of construction jobs and then thousands of ongoing operations jobs that, you know, we're knocking off a few zeros on that. Maybe I'll turn over to Mark to talk more about the manufacturing side. Well, so I'll just jump in really quickly and say that while what Eric said is correct, there's also a little bit of a shift going on where 
we need people to staff the factories. We're going to have to build factories, and we're going to have to build factories potentially for fuel, definitely for the MMR. And those are going to have to be high paying technical engineering based jobs for people to, you know, if, if a Boeing, if a Boeing factory can put out 500, um, what's the staff we're going to need to do 500 MMRs in a year. So, so it's not necessarily going to be direct for the communities that these power plants are going to, but there are definitely, there's definitely an economic boost in terms of, of the amount of hiring that we're going to have to do um, to support these operations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it kind of, kind of uh, you know, when we, we think about jobs in the, the energy industry, I think it's, it's always, well, the more jobs, the better. But, um, you know, with, there used to be a lot more jobs in agriculture uh, as, as well when people were doing things by hand. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we certainly uh, aren't uh, dismayed at the, the advent of things like combines and tractors. So um, I think these improvements in the efficiency of uh, producing energy are definitely a net good because uh, people who otherwise might have been making power can do something else that's productive. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah. Eric, if I, if, go ahead. If you don't mind, I, I, you know, to dovetail with that, I think just as a sort of a rounding off thought, um, th there's a cost to unserved energy. Uh, and this is where I show that I'm no longer just uh, just an engineer. Um, and, you know, the typical cost per kilowatt hour of unserved energy in a, in a, in a community like this, probably five to ten dollars. Uh, so for every kilowatt hour that that could have been used productively, that wasn't. Uh, it has a cost to that economy. So, so I think probably you know the, the 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 effect of the employment from a plant like this, which to be honest is the equivalent of a a, a mid-sized diesel generator, um, is 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 going to be way offset by having uh, abundant energy. And I think that that's a um, you know that that's kind of a, a very difficult thing to factor. And um, but you know the, the data's in. There's proof. It's well demonstrated that. That taking a a, 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 a a local economy that is constrained because there's not enough energy, and providing energy really boosts it, and you know it in, improves life for everyone and improves you know employment prospects. Um, so it's that probably has a you know a ten times magnification effect. Good point, Mark, and it 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 reminds me that you know one of the challenges that I think we've had. Um, you know, for OPG as a company that's run, you know, gigawatt class reactors for a long time, is we've realized that in many ways, the, the model to think about SMRs is actually not a nuclear model at all. And so it's a lot closer to the hydro stations or gas plants in terms of, um, you know, uh, it's less complicated. Um, can produce a, um, a, a consistent amount of power over a long period of time and doesn't have a huge staffing profile. And if you look at a, across, you know, one of the neat things about OPG is we use pretty much every fuel there is. We, we're not in the, in the um, industrial wind business, um, but, you know, we've got solar farm, we've got 66 hydro stations, we've got um, two big nuclear stations. We've got a number of gas plants. Um, so if you can use it to make electricity, we do. And so, uh, you know, I think about our, our small hydro plants that are in the, you know, 10 megawatt range. Some of them were built over a hundred years ago. Those are some of the, the least controversial uh, plants that we have, right? No, no, nothing's more popular than old hydro. But new hydro can be controversial, but old hydro, everybody's fine with, right? It's been there since they grew up. And, you know, I think we've got a, a similar opportunity where, you know, you, you're going to communities where we've had a, a hydro station there for 100 years. Um, most of the time, people aren't saying, why aren't there more jobs here? They're, you know, they're grateful that, that we've got that uh, consistent energy that is, you know, powering their communities. All right. Um, all right, we have a few more questions we want to get to here. Um, yeah, um, I think the first one I'd, I'd like to explore um, is to talk a little bit about the 
uh, conversations with communities uh, that you've been having? The uh, what types of objections have you been hearing to this this uh, potential uh, uh, program here? This uh, this project. Uh, what are you know what what do you do about the waste? Is probably a, a lot of what people have been been saying. I would guess. Um, what have those conversations been like? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think I would separate it into um, uh, sort of two groups where where there, you get um, different perspectives. Um, and one would be uh, indigenous communities um, with, who largely um, have been excluded from the benefits of uh, nuclear power generation over um, you know the history of the industry in Canada, and and um, and I, I think there um, that's it's our own fault as an industry that we um, have not been more thoughtful uh, about how to engage, and we've not been more inclusive in terms of sharing those benefits um, more more widely. Um, part of that is you know a legacy of history and the fact that um, the current legal and regulatory, um, uh, you know, judicial framework of Indigenous and treaty rights that we all take for granted now just wasn't uh, in place when we were building uh, our nuclear plants, um, you know, in, in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And so we really had to think hard about what engagement looks like when we don't have the same success stories to point to with indigenous communities that we have to with say municipalities where municipalities that so became host communities for nuclear got um, you know huge economic benefits in terms of a highly paid workforce and property taxes and all sorts of good things that make a, you know a mayor and council and the economic development uh, department really excited when you're coming to town and so I would say that um, in the non-Indigenous communities, a, a lot of the questions we're getting um, are, yes, to your point about waste, particularly because as we're out doing our environmental assessment engagement right now, which is about building a new reactor, um, Chalk River, where, uh, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, our, our host essentially, is in the process of decommissioning two of their old facilities. And so there's a lot of questions about, well, how does this project relate to that? And are you going to do the same thing with your waste? Um, so there's some confusion there, which is totally understandable. But I would say that the, the other question that we've been getting from, from the public, uh, we had a neat town hall that we did by phone last week that, where we got um, almost 4,000 people um, call in over the course of the hour and some really good questions is, some people were confused about why we needed to build anything at Chalk River because they didn't see the need for the energy. So they, they, they hadn't um, quite understood that what we were doing was using the Chalk River campus and the, the tremendous human resources, um, uh, you know, the expertise of the scientists, the researchers who understand nuclear so well, and really building on that track record of nuclear innovation at Chalk River as a launching point for deployment in remote areas, certainly across Canada. So I think once we explain that, that the point isn't to build a five megawatt reactor at Chalk River because Chalk River needs five megawatts, like that's not the point at all. Point is, if you're going to test a, a new technology and try to get a commercial demonstration project up and running to prove that it's deployable uh, much more broadly, that Chalk River is an excellent place to do that. And I think once we framed it up that way, um, th there was a lot more uh, understanding uh, of what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, we have a, a couple more online questions here. Um, so one, one person was curious about how climate change comes into the conversation here. Um, certainly, there are some challenges with conventional reactors about the, the use of, of water as a coolant um, at times, uh, uh, considering the droughts, uh, unreliable weather patterns. Uh, they want, uh, curious what you think about, quote, dry reactors that do not use any water or steam as a future development. 
Maybe that's a Mark question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think, um, you know, a, a lot of really large reactors today rely on very big volumes of water pumped from a, a neighboring water body as their ultimate heat sink for cooling. Uh, we don't. Our, our reactor is dry cooled. Uh, we, we may use steam in places, but that's not um, not by any measure a significant amount of water. Um, I think, you know, in our applications, um, I should say that the, the real impacts of climate change are being felt today. They're, they're absolutely proximate um, and are challenging the people's way of life. You know, it's, uh, for instance, the one example is that uh, communities served by diesel, a lot of the diesel is brought in over winter roads. Um, and if you don't have a cold enough winter, there's no road and you don't get diesel. Um, I remember being told a story of a, a uh, mine, I think, in, uh, in the Yukon Territory where they had to fly in the diesel for a year and it was uh, 1,300 C-130 airlifts to bring in the fuel to keep, to keep the mine and community just operating at a minimum. Um, and, you know, this is, not, this is not a theoretical impact. This is something that's happening today. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's going to become a huge sustainability, sustainability issue for these, uh, for these communities. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're very much uh, on, on track in terms of uh, minimizing our footprint. Uh, we don't need to extract water. We use dry cooling. Um, you know, everything's recycled. Uh, the quantities in any case are really small. Um, so that's great. And that, that's, you know, definitely um, uh, a, a good way to go. Uh, but I think, you know, it's, it's in the broader context of, you know, uh, making the community less dependent on, on seasonal, there, you know, the seasons being right, um, you know, eliminating uh, CO2 emissions in an area where, where it's, uh, it's more uh, critical. And in fact, when you burn a lot of diesel, you end up with uh, what they call black snow, where you get soot laying on the snow. And when the, when the soot lays on the snow, it melts a lot quicker. Uh, so you sort of have an accelerating effect from that, you know, eliminating all of these effects at once. Uh, it really is, uh, you know, punching far above its weight. Yeah, and if, if you don't mind me jumping in um, on, on the big picture cl climate change piece, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think it would it would just be naive of us to ignore that that it's climate change, which is pushing policymakers and and individual consumers to be thinking more about where their energy comes from. I mean, if, if you want the cheapest power possible, you burn coal and you burn shale gas, period. Because the cost of that waste is externalized. You, you send your waste up the chimney and it's somebody else's problem. Whereas we're, we in the nuclear industry are responsible for every... <laughs> every iota of waste that we've ever produced and, and we manage that you know forever so uh th there's a big difference and i think when you when you look at even at, at the promise of smrs as a category even going more broadly than the, the very small modular reactor you know five megawatt um that, that we're looking at building at chalk river even opg's ambitions for more grid scale reactors are more sized in that 300 to 400 megawatt range, significantly smaller than the gigawatt class reactors we traditionally built, because as jurisdictions across the world are looking at retiring coal, there's a tremendous opportunity to come in with SMR's grid scale about the size of those retired coal plants, plunking them down in areas that already have transmission infrastructure, retraining some staff, that worked at your thermal plant and getting them to, to run a new non-emitting reactor. And, and we're really seized with the, the um, challenge that you've got jurisdictions like Saskatchewan that have made commitments to get off coal. And if we can demonstrate that SMRs are a viable replacement, um, you know, to bring online in the early 2030s, then they're going to build SMRs. But if we don't, if we fail to do that, what they're going to do is build a bunch of natural gas fueled plants that are going to run for 30 years to justify the capital investment. And so that's what the, how climate change is presenting us with a real burning platform on SMR development. 
not just for, for projects of this size, but uh, grid scale as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, you know, we're seeing that in, uh, in Germany recently where <laughs> they've already made a decision on uh, what to do um, with their nuclear fleet. Uh, but unfortunately, there isn't a, a, a different replacement that can provide that. So you see Germany, you know, the, the um, uh, poster child of the environmental movement in, in, in many people's eyes, uh, building a new coal plant in, in the year and turning it on in the year 2020. Um, kind of crazy. Um, so this is a little tangential, um, but we've, this is a question I would like, like to hear uh, answered. And the, the way I'll segue to it is on the question of environmental justice. Um, uh, Eric, as, as you mentioned earlier, there is a kind of a, a legacy of um, maybe interactions between the nuclear industry and the uh, indigenous communities that uh, haven't inspired a lot of confidence, I guess would be a, a generous way to say it. Um, so, uh, and, and similarly, we, we see people of color often located uh, in neighborhoods close to uh, coal plants, gas plants, et cetera, that are uh, you know, facing serious health impacts because of those. Um, what, in what ways are you guys thinking that maybe this project or more, more broadly um, micro reactor and SMR technology can help to uh, kind of alleviate and make, make right some of those past uh, environmental injustices? Um, one of the, the things that, um, that has, that makes me really proud to work for OPG is that over the last decade, every single one of our greenfield generation projects that we've built has been done in partnership with indigenous communities, local indigenous communities as equity owners. So we've done three projects on the hydroelectric side um, and, and a solar project as well. So in each of those communities, we, we partnered with, with the, the indigenous community and, and not just brought in a long-term revenue stream from the project, but in so doing, um, created an opportunity for those communities to borrow against that predictable future income to spend it on any other community priorities they had, whether that was housing or education or economic development. And, and the transformation that we've seen in those communities ha has just been phenomenal. I mean, when you are, you know, Canada is grappling um, a, as a nation with the whole issue of indigenous reconciliation and, and what that looks like. And economic reconciliation is a big part of that. And there are parts of the sector. I mean, I'm, I'm not backtracking on what I said about the failure um, of our industry to, to share those benefits um, broadly with indigenous communities, but there are success stories. So you think about, for example, the Dene communities of Northern Saskatchewan that have um, supplied services to the uranium mines. Um, they have built a, a, a great economic success story that might have started with, you know, cafeteria and cleaning service contracts, and then gone to trucking contracts, and then gone to engineering contracts. And, and you look at um, the, the way that uh, that economic power has been leveraged and used to create a whole bunch of benefits to the community. And, and I think that has to be the model. Um, you, you, you're going to have to look at, uh, at the sharing of the benefits with indigenous communities as, um, uh, as something that is going to be the most predictable um, and expected conversation you're gonna have when you come into traditional territory. Hmm. Huh. Well, thank you for that. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that that is at uh, front of mind um, as this, this project continues. Um, so we're, we're getting close to the end of our, our time together here. Um, I think, uh, perhaps uh, I might ask Mark to to tee up our the way we we end every uh, clean power hour together is with a little bit of a call to action. So um, I'll ask uh, Mark uh, to maybe just give us a, a a brief summary of where Global First Power, um, which again for anybody who joined later, is kind of a, a combined effort between Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation 
and OPG, Ontario Power, Power Generation. So where Global First Power is at in their application process to the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And, um, and then I'll uh, kind of say what, what we can do as, as the public who is supportive of, of clean power, supportive of the next generation of nuclear, how we can get plugged in and make sure we're helping with this effort. So where are we at now, Mark? Well, I just want to interrupt myself, if I may, and just say yeah. thanks, Eric and uh, Generation Atomic for, for taking the time to talk to us. Um, you know, it's, it's really great. And thank you to everyone who's, who's come online and, and given up some of their day to, to, uh, to ask uh, you know, good and challenging questions um, and watch us uh, uh, wriggle and rise as we, we think about them and answer them. Um, I'm generally not allowed to speak. That's, uh, that's what Wendy's saying. Uh, Head shake is saying, I'm, um, but yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, for hosting this. You know, I think um, this is a real project. It's progressing. It's we're, we're not talking about doing a project. We're actually executing. Uh, we're in licensing uh, with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, uh, and in fact, we're in a in a stage of licensing where there is an opportunity for the public uh, to make their uh, themselves make their voices heard. And this is perhaps a, a very fortuitous time. Uh, you know, for you to ask that question, because, um, you know, we, we are uh, one of the main steps of licensing uh, a plant in Canada is getting a environmental permit, getting an environmental impact assessment completed um, and getting an environmental license to start work. And that's the phase we're in right now. Uh, we've uh, the CNSC is defining the scope of the environmental impact statement and when they fix the scope we'll be able to submit our uh, environmental impact statement and basically proceed on developing the project um we we're quite near the end of that that statement has been uh, there was a public comments period last year on on the project asking for public input um, the cnsc has done a great job in processing those and understanding them and uh, making a taking a view on what's an appropriate environmental impact scope um, that's been put out uh, by the CNSC along with all of the um, information and the comments. They're all public record and available to read um, and, and mull over. And, and they're basically asking the public to weigh in uh, before the commission uh, sits down and makes a decision on the scope and, and how we proceed. So that's where we are right now. And I think hmm. it's uh, perhaps a very useful place to get involved. Eric? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, be, be even more pointed than that. Uh, I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, the there are no shortage of people who are going to be writing into the CNSC to say um, the environmental assessment is scoped too narrowly. It needs to be much more complicated. It needs to be much more expensive. It needs to take much more time because they have no interest in seeing any nuclear projects proceed. This is the first license for an SMR in Canada. This is the first EA for an SMR in Canada. And there are people who would prefer that, that nuclear become a sunset industry. So if you feel otherwise, now is a perfect time to send a letter as a member of the public or from whatever organization you, you belong to, to say that you think that SMRs are a good energy um, option for Canada, and that um, that it, you'd like to see the the project and the environmental assessment proceed. Yeah, absolutely, um, Wendy. Anything to add? I think they pretty much covered it. <laughs> All right. That was a, I really I like the way that Eric put it together. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great. Well. Um, you know, thank thank you again to uh, all, all of you guys for joining us. Um, this is where I'm going to just quick uh, throw up a slide here of sorts. Um, all right. And our guests can't see it, but all those on the stream can. Um, this is four big reasons to comment in support of Global First Power's micro modular reactor application. Uh, we have, of course, electricity, um, water purification as a potential uh, application of this that's technology process heat and indoor agriculture just just uh, four of many reasons um, tonight actually at uh, 5 30 in the eastern we will be having a, a comment writing happy hour uh, you can join at this link here 
bit.ly slash MMR happy hour. And the last day to submit a comment, um, I, I have 530 on here, but I think there's 31 days in May. So the 31st um, would be that. Um, and then you can see here, I've been working together um, with a good friend of mine and the person running the comments today, Sean Wagner of Alberta Nuclear Nucleus, uh, to uh, put together a commenting guide. Uh, as you see here. So we have uh, different things you could write about, different examples of uh, ways that this, this project is really in the best interest of Canada and of, of the communities around Chalk River. And uh, we're hoping to get as many submissions as we can. Um, as, as Eric said, there's no shortage of people who are going to be writing in uh, in opposition to this uh, because of uh, well, you know, articulated reasons over time of, of uh, nuclear fear or just uh, in general, um, a dis dislike of splitting atoms, um, but we're at a at a point in our uh, species history here, inflection point, where we need um, people to stand up for this technology, and so we can pave pave the way to a brighter future uh, for tomorrow. So I hope you can join us with that and submit a comment. And uh, I guess I'll just uh, once again uh, thank all of our our guests, all of our amazing viewers uh, who participated today. And uh, yeah, hope to see you guys again, uh, either <laughs> in about four and a half hours <laughs> uh, or the next uh, clean power hour that we have. Um, so thanks again, everyone. And uh, we'll sign off there.